Yeah. As long as it doesn't cause echo. Okay, so we have folks coming in. And we are going to get started in just a second, folks. Thank you all for showing up tonight. And just so everybody knows, we are also streaming this live on Facebook. And we will have um, people able to see that and share that across Facebook. The meeting's also going to be recorded. And we'll be able to. Um, uh, share this with the city who will post it on their YouTube page um, uh, starting tomorrow or after the fact. And then also we'll have it rotating on their programming on the TVs, uh, on the TV channels that the city has. So where on Facebook will we find this? So it's going to start on um, my profile and then it can be shared out to, pub it's a public video. So anyone can share it to any number of pages or on their own page, uh, just like with any video. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So good evening, everybody. My name is Gabe Turan. I'm the first vice chair, vice chair for the Inner Neighborhood Council Organization, the INCO. And tonight is the September 23rd, uh, 2020 elections measures, um, ballot measures forum that we're going to be having for you this evening. And I'll introduce our um, panelists uh, and proponents for the measures you'll be hearing about tonight. And then we'll introduce our planning group who helped put all of this together for you. So first, I'm going to introduce Mr. Aaron Starr, who is the proponent and the author of measures F, L, M, and N, which we'll be hearing about a little bit later. And then uh, Mr. Alex Nguyen, who is the city manager for the city of Oxnard and proponent tonight for measure E. We'll be going in alphabetical order. So we'll start with E and we'll end the evening with N. And uh, the way it'll work is that each measure is going to get a 20 minute block of presentation time. It's five measures and we want to get it done in um, the amount of time that we have set aside for it and get all of you the information that you all want to hear. And also um, the way it'll work is they'll have five minutes presentation time and then the next 15 minutes will be questions and answers. We have some questions that were gleaned from the public leading up to this event, but you can also see there's a questions and answers or Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to type in questions into that Q&A box. And uh, when we get through these initial questions that were the most frequently asked questions, uh, then we'll turn it to the Q&A box and go from there. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Alex Nguyen, the city manager for the city of Oxnard, who will be presenting on Measure E. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. So let me do this. Sure. Okay, Gabe, it's saying that only you can share content right now. Sorry, I didn't mean to be so greedy about that. Let me uh, change that for you. <laughs> All right, you should be able to now. All right. Tell me if that's showing up, please. I see it. Yes, it is. OK, so let me just dive right into it. I'm going to give a very, very condensed version. Uh, I gave a full presentation to the city council last night that's also available on the city's YouTube station. I have a slide for that at the very end. So very quickly, getting to the bottom line, we have a large city. Uh, in fact, everyone knows we're the largest city in the county and therefore we have the largest population. We're also one of the oldest cities. We have aging infrastructure and we have a lot of needs and demands, but we also are extremely busy with the tax dollars that we do get with our current revenue. So I'm gonna go through these slides very quickly. A lot of information here. I'm not gonna go over it in detail. You can see these for yourselves later um, because these slides are available on the website. But just to show you, you can glance at the numbers of how much work we do day in and day out. So there's uh, statistics for police in terms of the numbers of responses and the kinds of cases they do. You can just see these are very large numbers. Fire, you can see some of these stats here, over 20,000 calls. 
uh, nearly 15, and by the way, these are all from last year, nearly 15,000 calls for medical emergencies in um, cultural and community services. You can see the kinds of numbers here, uh, the hundreds of thousands of visitors we get through our library in, in terms of visits. Uh, same with the youth programs, senior programs, and after school programs. Public works, here are just a few stats. There are, of course, many more available on our website. The point I'm making is we are a very busy city. We have a lot of demands for services and programs, and we work hard every day. Now, the essence of government is that we run on taxes. We don't run on revenue or profits. And like most other cities, 77% of our revenues come from taxes. Now, what most people may not realize is only a small portion of our sales tax actually stays here in Oxnard. So right now our sales tax rate is 7.75 and we only keep 1.5 of that. So most of it goes uh, to the state and to the county. Only a small portion stays here. One of the things people uh, ask about is why do we need to do this when the cities around us uh, look and appear so much better? And I hope people will take the time to study this chart later, but in, in a nutshell, uh, Thousand Oaks and Camarillo are much newer cities. We are much older. So they have newer infrastructure. They are smaller cities in terms of population. They have much less demand for services and they are frankly wealthier cities. Their property values are much higher. They actually get more, um, sales tax revenue than we do per capita. That's just the bottom line. We can't match them when it comes to tax revenue between property taxes and sales tax. Where would we spend measure E? Again, I know this is a busy uh, uh, slide, but there's a lot of information. I hope people take time to look later, but it's essentially going to restore services and programs that we've lost over the years. There is no promise of measure E uh, going to enhance anything. It's really about restoring services to the adequate levels, whether that's in 911 emergency response or keeping our public spaces clean and safe, keeping up with our infrastructure, addressing our homeless crisis, getting uh, our, our arms wrapped around landscaping and tree trimming again, uh, restoring all the services and programs we've lost in terms of youth and senior programs, as well as being financially secure so we can be prepared for another crisis like we're in now. One minute remaining. What happens uh, if we don't? Very straightforward. You've seen this year after year, we have a structural deficit. We don't have enough money to provide all the services, so we will be cutting more and more. And that's simply bo the bottom line. We have the forecast for double digit million dollar budget deficits in the coming years. So without Measure E, we will be deepening the cuts and losing more and more services. And in terms of lower income people, the most basic household budget, groceries, for, uh, prescription drugs, utilities, and rent is not taxed. And I argue that our low income families need our services most. So Measure E will support them the most. Thank you. Okay, our first two uh, panelists who will be, and uh, planning group members who will be asking are Alex Ray Rivera and Yolanda Solorio. And I believe Alex is going to start us off. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, this question is to the city manager. Why did the, why did the city choose one and a half percent sales tax increase over other options like 1% or half a cent? Because we evaluated what our needs were in order to restore services. And this is what it's going to take. And I didn't want to play games and make it easy, um, you know, to do a half a percent or 1% knowing that that wouldn't be enough. So there's nothing that would frustrate our community more if they were to approve a sales tax increase, then to actually not see real results. Thank you. Next, um, next question. So why is there no sunset for Measure E? Oh, because this is about getting our revenues in line with our demands and for our expenses. So again, sunsetting something like this would be irresponsible of me. It would be easy, but it would be irresponsible. The reason it's permanent because the city of Oxnard is permanent. 
I don't expect in any of our lives, lifetimes that the city of Oxnard is going to go away or disappear or shut down. This is what it takes to run this city and to provide the services and the, the programs that everybody needs and, and deserves to have. So sunsetting it would, would just set up another similar fiscal crisis some years out. And that's the wrong thing to do. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, why is there no oversight committee? Because um, there is an oversight committee. So the committee is the city council's finance and governance committee. It's a formal committee now of the city council. So all the expenditures will go through them and then it would go through to the full city council. And these are the people who are elected to manage the city's budget, to set the spending priorities and to hold me and the entire staff accountable. And in terms of who holds them accountable, that's all of us, all of us who live here and who, who vote here who, um, and who are residents here, right? Local democracy is a two way street. So it's all of us, it's incumbent upon all of us to hold city hall accountable. It's not a one way street. Thank you. All right, on the next question, you know, why is uh, uh, Measure E different from Measure O? How's that, how's that different? Because we believe that we're gonna get these services when we approve Measure O. So can you tell us, um, Mr. City Manager? Well, um, well, number one, there's no sunset on this. Number two, remember Measure O, after it was passed, the Great Recession hit. And Measure O, I keep trying to explain to people, became a life preserve for the city's budget. So instead of going to enhance a series of services, it, it was used to shore up uh, essential services. But when you look at, at the Measure O expenditures year over year, you actually see that the expenditures in the end went to all those categories that they were supposed to. What happened is it went in different proportions. So what I ask of everyone is no one has a crystal ball. So you couldn't predict um, that measure O would have had to turn into our life preserve. These things happen and the city has to respond. So I, I, I argue against the narrative that measure O was misspent. It had to be spent in different proportions. Now in terms of measure E, like I said, I laid out exactly <coughs> what I recommend to the council to spend the money on. And it isn't like, you know, people want to say there, it's a blank check. It's not a blank check because there are only certain things we're allowed to spend these monies on anyway. 15 seconds remaining in this. So the question becomes, how do you prioritize them? So I've already shared publicly what I would recommend to the city council. Thank you. Go ahead, Yoli. Uh, the next question is, is this going to pension obligations? A very, very, very small portion of it would, but not, not the bulk of it, not even, I mean, the bulk of it will go to services and programs. That's also another, another narrative out there that's I think is out there to, to get people whipped up into being angry about. Okay, Alex, so, so why should we trust you now? Another one and a half percent sales tax increase when the city of Oxford has a, a long history of mismanaging finances. And there is that belief that it will go towards pension uh, uh, costs, high costs. Okay, so number one, and I don't, look, so I've only been here two years. So I understand there's a lot of stuff in the past that people are unhappy about. And as I said last night, I'm, I, I simply don't have a time machine where I can go back and undo anything. All I can do is the best I can now to keep this organization afloat to bring excellence in terms of our staff and our services and programs and to keep everything accountable and above board and have all of our books open. I'm committed to doing that. That's my profession. Now, to be very blunt and realistic, the, the business of the city has to continue. And I happen to be the city manager that's here now. So you've got to give me the benefit of the doubt. That, that's just the way it is. Now you can, you can try to go and get a new city manager, which is basically what happened when, when I was brought here. It happened when my predecessor was brought here. 
The key thing here is you've got to hold your electeds accountable. And it isn't a once every four year exercise. You have to hold them accountable, you know, month after month, all the time. You can't just wait till the election cycle comes and then, and then ask them tough questions. You've got to do it on a regular basis. And I think in this community, we have the, infra the infrastructure set up to do that through the neighborhood council meetings and so on. Thank you. And the final question would be, what are the steps to correct issues found during audits? Oh, well, we've been making a lot of corrections. Uh, depends on what the issues are, but we've made tons of corrections. And in fact, uh, so if you go back to the 2015 audit, they found uh, 65 uh, items of material weakness, which is the, the material weakness is the worst finding uh, you can have as an organization. There were 65 of them. And we've been making progress in the years since then. And this current year, um, they didn't have any uh, material weakness findings. So we've made a lot of progress. We've, we've implemented more stronger internal controls. Uh, we actually bring in more talented staff. Uh, in some cases, we move out staff who couldn't, couldn't do, you know, couldn't perform the work. And we have to stay on top of it. It's not something that you do once a year when you get the audit, you work on it throughout the year. So I'm very proud of the progress we've made and, and the best stamp of approval is standard and poor's improving <laughs> our rating from stable um, to positive. So you, you can't have a better um, stamp of approval than, than, um, than that. So I'm, I'm 15 seconds. happy about the progress we've made and we will continue to make progress. Thank you. All right, so um, we actually do have one question that came into the Q&A box in regards to this measure. And Alex, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, um, we can see all of the uh, panelists here. Thank you. So the question comes in and it asks, we're constantly needing something to catch up with budgets. Uh, gentle poverty. Why are we spending so much in the first place? I, I, what was the first part of that question? We're, we're constantly needing what? We are constantly needing something to catch up with budgets. I think mm -hmm. my interpretation is why are we constantly asking for more or are we always doing something to catch up with budgets? Why are mm -hmm. we spending so much in the first place? Well, we're spending what we need to spend to provide services for a city of this size. You got, people got to understand this city is more than 100 years old. It has a lot of aging infrastructure and there's a lot of demand on, on the infrastructure, but also on programs and services. So uh, when you say we're constantly asking, the last time was measure O and now it's measure E. But what we're doing is, and I'm being responsible about this, we're asking for what we need, not what we want, what we fantasize about. We're only asking for what we need in order to get this city back in shape. So my question is, you've got to, do you want the city to continue to go downhill or do you want to make a choice for the future and get the city to improve to the level that we all can be proud of? Thank you. Okay, and we have one last question before we move on to the next measure. And that is, what happens if E fails and sunset of measure O passes, which I think they're referring to measure N? Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the case, then we will deepen our cuts. We've been making cuts year after year and we'll continue to make more cuts. And if, if the revenue picture doesn't change, which it wouldn't for, for several years, then we're going to lose many of our civic programs, right? whether it's libraries, um, youth programs, senior programs, those will all be gone. I guarantee you that because those are the recommendations I would make. And then we would start depending on our finances and depends on the length and the depth and the breadth of this current recession, we may or may not have to eat into public safety and that will erode our, our response times when people call 911. It's just a fact, doesn't mean we're gonna go bankrupt, but it means we could end up be, becoming essentially a public safety city without any civic programming. 
And that is, believe it or not, buying a lot of trouble in the long term. Because imagine what happens in our community if we don't have these programs for youth and we can't have support services for seniors. Think about how that cycle and how everything impacts each other. And then what happens is then you become even more dependent on police. The thing that you don't want is to be wholly dependent on policing. This has happened in other communities. Look at what happens in other cities and look at their crime rates and look at their police interactions with their community. The evidence is out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for that portion. We're going to go ahead and wrap up the Measure E portion of the evening. The 20 minutes is just really quick, but we have a lot of measures to cover. I really appreciate your time on that, uh, Mr. Nguyen. And thank so you. with that being said, um, I had sent you a message regarding giving me control back of the um, screen. So while we do that, uh, I'd like to introduce our um, next uh, proponent, who is Mr. Aaron Starr, and he's proponent for our next measure, which is Measure F, and uh, he will be sharing with us about it, and he's also the author of it and uh, uh, advocated to gather signatures and get it placed onto the ballot. So we're just going to take just a second here to transition back. Let's see here. Are you able to uh, share your screen yet, uh, Mr. Starr? Not yet. It says host disable participant screen sharing. Okay. Uh, uh, Alex, I had sent you a message regarding um, making me the host again, if you can do that. I think you're muted. Yeah, let me see how I can do that because I stopped sharing content. So you should have the ability to click the three dots on my name and then it would um, give you some options for me. Mm -hmm. So uh, should I say stop live stream from my end? No. Uh, right. Webinar? You make me host. Okay. I don't see that. Let me try it again. You may have to click on the participants button too. And then ah, okay. Got it. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. It just shifted Perfect. to. There, thank you. Any chance I get to um, take advantage of that bachelor's degree in information technology, it just keeps paying for itself. So I did That's that all off the top of my head. All right. So, Aaron, I am going to. Um, Send this um, ability over to you. And same thing at the end, please send it back to me at the, well, you're going to do the next presentation, number of them. So I think we'll be good on that. So I'm going to turn this over to you. You can start sharing your screen. And I will start your 20 minutes once your presentation starts. And while he's getting that ready, one thing I failed to mention at the top, folks, is that each of our um, questions during the Q&A portion has a one minute, 30 second uh, timer attached to the question response. Okay, are you ready, Aaron? Uh, I think so. Okay, I do see your screen, so uh, go ahead and... Great, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first measure is Measure F. It's permit simplicity. It's an optional, safer, faster permit system to attract jobs to Oxnard. And my screen is not updating. There it is. So what's wrong with our current system? The current system is really quite dysfunctional. It doesn't work for people. There's been many horror stories that have been sent out there to, uh, about it taking years to get permits. We've got contractors and architects that refuse to do business here. Uh, we even have stories about the city asking for donations to city programs uh, so that the plans go through the system faster. And I wanna remind you that plans are important but approved, approved plan doesn't guarantee safe construction. What you really need is you need enough inspectors to ensure that you've got uh, <laughs> safe construction out there. So what's the result of the current system? Well, you now have a black market of illegal construction because people can't get through the system. They're going to go around it. They're going to build unlawfully, which means you're going to have more unpermitted, uninspected, unsafe buildings. It discourages existing employers from expanding here in Oxnard. It discourages new employers from coming here to Oxnard. That results in fewer higher paying local jobs, lower sales tax and property tax revenues, 
And residents just have lots of hassles doing even just simple upgrades to their own homes. So what does Measure F do? Measure F is a program that allows eligible projects to get permits in a single day. It's successfully used elsewhere like Phoenix, Arizona and the surrounding cities, Elk Grove, California, and uh, Rancho Cordova, California. So how does it work? Basically, you have licensed professionals like architects and civil engineers who have completed a city approved training program. They're able to submit plans, provided they get pre-approvals from various departments like the fire department or maybe from the county for restaurant health, for restaurant health permits, let's say. And they submit all those together at once, completed in a way that the building department wants. They certify compliance with the city building codes and safety codes. They have to have adequate insurance and they accept the risks for liability. So what does Measure F not do? It does not bypass zoning laws, building codes, health and safety laws, or field inspections. It is not a get out of jail free card. So some people say, is this the wild west? Well, not if Phoenix, Arizona is the wild west. That's a modern city, fifth largest city in the, in, the, in the nation. Now, what's very important is this. If you've got a project that requires a civil structural engineer, like if you have a load bearing wall, the city designates an additional civil structural engineer to peer review the plan before plan submission. This is not just self-certification. If you've got something where something can load bearing wall. So the city can either issue the permit if all the paperwork is there, or they can reject it, in which case you must use the older, slower process. So what happens after a permit is issued? It's subjected to audits and rigorous inspections. The city can require changes to bring the project into conformity or even just yank the permit altogether. If there's any failures in the audit, they can suspend the professionals, they can eject them from the program, and they don't want that to happen because then they're under the old system. So how will this improve Oxnard? It's gonna attract higher paying employers to Oxnard. You're not gonna get strung along for two years. You're gonna have confidence that you can get your building through the system. It's gonna increase city revenues. It's gonna make it easier for residents to improve their own homes. And it's gonna increase public safety. Why? Because when you have a system that works, where you can actually get a permit, you're gonna have fewer unpermitted projects and it frees up resources at City Hall so it can focus more on the inspections because that's where all the problems with safety occur. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions. Thank you. Our um, planning committee members who will be pre uh, asking questions for this will be uh, Mr. Dave Ebbett and Ms. Diana Velzi. Hi, Mr. Starr. Hi, thank you. So the first question that comes in is, why do all permits and not just simple common job type permits, such as roofing, water heaters, et cetera, go through this program and allow the others to continue the way the current program is set up? Well, first of all, remember, this is optional. This doesn't require that everybody use the new program. It's an optional program for people that want to get things through the system. And the bigger problem out there has been some of the larger projects. That is where the delays take place. I've heard of stories of churches that take two years to get a permit. It's just crazy. I've heard of even simple things like, you know, paving a parking lot can take forever. Uh, we just have a system that is just completely broken. It has been for years. Now, us taking this to, to this extent is going to bring in some major employers into town. I mean, our the company I work for came to town because the system was, you know, we had people at City Hall that were willing to make things happen really quickly. And that's why we have a big company today that employs 1,400 people here. You couldn't do that today in Oxnard. Okay. Thank you. Next. Um, how, how can they keep the integrity of the building and the developer? How can I, I don't understand the question. Can you please repeat that or restate it? Well, do, uh, how do we, how, how, how can we ensure the integrity of the, of the, of these, uh, the developer and the building, um, of the oh, buildings 
So the professionals, so basically we have a system of audits. So mm -hmm. anybody that's a new professional to the system uh, undergoes, like I think their first four projects are audited. And uh, every year they have to be audited on a certain fraction of their projects. If it's above a certain size, I think above 100,000 square feet, it automatically gets audited. I think if it's above three stories, it automatically gets audited. So the idea is you get the permits through quickly and then you can get people started. And then you still have the field inspections that go in. You have rigorous field inspections where they go out. And if there's a problem, they can say, stop. Because you can't put up a building in a day. OK. Audits, when does that happen? That's city. The city will perform the audits. So the city will perform the audits. And they get to decide on the schedule and the type of audit they want to do. But they are required to do audits under this ordinance. Are the audits done before or after construction begins? Uh, they, they can be done immediately. There's nothing that stops uh, city from immediately starting an audit. It's once they issue the permit, they can start. So it can even be before construction. Okay. okay, next question. Will liability rates go up for these professionals? So the professionals are the ones that buy the insurance if they mm -hmm. want to be part of the program. So since it's an optional program, they don't have to do it. But what we're finding in other cities like Phoenix, for example, is they wanna be part of that program. So they're buying insurance, they're, you know, they're, they're signing the hold harmless letters with the city mm -hmm. and it, it, it works. Okay, next. Will the city be losing revenue on these fees, on the fees? I think if anything, they might make more money because when you think about it, you still have, you, I'll tell you why, because number one, you're gonna have more projects that are out there that are being done. Those projects require that there be audits made. It requires that inspections be done. So when you have zero activity out there, the city doesn't bring in any revenues, right? So you wanna bring up the activity in town so that there's more revenues coming in and that'll cover the, the cost of the city. Will the rates go up? It depends how the city structures its, uh, system, I suppose. If they're efficient, hopefully no. But which rates are we talking about exactly? Uh, I'm, I'm the revenue and fees, I believe. So I guess I'm not understanding your question. Uh, there's, there's too much background noise. Can other people turn off their microphones? Uh, the revenues and fees uh, through the city, will the, the fees go up for the city for because they will be losing fees for that? Well, remember, the, the city is supposed to only charge to cover their costs. So it really shouldn't be like a profit making center. No. All right, Dave. And Aaron, next question is, what is in place to protect the public from cut corners by self-certification projects? Well, first of all, they're not really self-certification. What you've mm -hmm. got is you still have the outside, you know, civil structural engineer that needs to, to review it. So they have their licenses on the line. You know, if you're an architect or civil engineer, you don't want to do bad projects because you can get sued. And, you know, you can lose a lot of money that way. Uh, but where I think the bigger problems are is in the construction phase itself. Because uh, you can have a great set of plans, but if the crew out there that does the work, that does the construction, uh, if they do a bad job, then you're gonna have problems. So you need more inspectors out there. Correct, thank you. What are, what are the remedies for harm done by self-certified projects? What are the remedies for harm for harm done to whom? The client, the city, somebody, who are we talking about? The customer, the buyer. So basically there's insurance. Oh. So, so the, the architects and civil engineers, they're required to be heavily insured. So they have to file lawsuits. I mean, you got the same issue with any construction project today. I mean, today you've got projects that 
are done, which are defective. I'll give you an example. Even the city admits that their own fire stations are not up to code. It went through their, their system, their inspectors, their approval, and the city argues that their fire stations are don't need code. Okay. Okay, Dave. Okay, and Aaron, the next question, where else is this implemented to this degree of all self-certified? Do we have other cities with other examples? Well, once, once again, we're, it's not really self-certification. You have a system where you have peer review, but mm -hmm. basically we would have the most robust system. Now, back when Phoenix started it, people were saying, hey, this isn't done anywhere else. Why are we doing this here? Well, someone's got to be first. And if we do this correctly, uh, we're going to be able to bring in a lot of business. So when a program works, it's worthy of expansion. So if we go ahead with this, we're going to have to track businesses like we never had before. I can tell you stories about people. You don't want to be a business owner who buys a piece of property, invests hundreds of thousands of dollars in architectural plans, and then find out that you can't actually move into Oxnard. That's a right. disaster. True. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have any local trade unions endorsed this measure? No, we haven't. We haven't asked any. All right. And I have one more question. How will the public know who to contact for these? contractors that are verified. So what other cities are doing is, is they're providing a list. Mm -hmm. They're providing a list of, el of eligible professionals. Okay, perfect. Because you still have to go through the city's training program before you can be part of this system. Okay. And candidly, a lot of these folks, they're gonna advertise that they're part of the permit simplicity program because then somebody who wants to do a project knows that it's going to get done quickly and not have to wait for months or years. So Perfect. I think it'll be heavily advertised. Perfect. Gabe, do we have any other questions? We do. Thank you. We've had a couple come in. Um, one follow-up one to uh, what was mentioned earlier about the cities that currently have it. Um, it was mentioned in a report earlier this year that um, Elk Grove and uh, I believe Sacramento County um, discontinued their programs. Uh, Phoenix is uh, limited. And then I believe Rancho Cordova elected not to pursue it. Uh, is this correct? Or do they, do they still have them? Like if I called Elk Grove tomorrow, they could tell me a little bit about their program. So, so let me see if I can put my video on so you can see, see me. How do I do that? So I can answer your question because I want to show you something. Keeping in mind, uh, Mr. Starr, that this is still a minute and a half response oh, for this oh, question. Well, stop your share. Stop so your let share me stop now. the share for a moment. And I want to put on, if you can see my video. After the city put out their report, we said that was nonsense. We actually visited Elk Grove and said, show us your plans. And they did. We, we have copy of the rules and the permits and, uh, for permit simplicity at, at Rancho Cordova. We, we have, we got flyers there. Part one of my slides even shows uh, the actual poster they have on their wall there. So I don't know where, I don't know where the city got their information, but we went up there, checked it up for ourselves and the city was just wrong. I mean, we talked to the people that were there. Thank you for that. And then um, a follow up also, uh, as far as the um, liability rates for the um, professionals who will be participating, uh, it was mentioned that will their rates go up and then will that cost be passed on to uh, the consumers or the public or whoever does business with these developers? Will the liability rates for insurance go up for the professionals? Correct. I mean, it depends on their track record, I would think. But remember, what, what folks can do is, once again, this is an optional program. Professionals don't have to be involved with this at all. So if a professional wants to keep doing it the same old way he's been doing it, and their clients want to deal with them, that's fine. If it turns out 
that working with a professional that can get something done right away costs a little bit more. Well, maybe a customer wants to pay for that because he's going to save six months to a year uh, of his time and be able to get the project done. So think of it as a premium that somebody could pay for an extra service. Thank you very much. We have time for just uh, one or two more questions here, and I'm going to go to the Q&A box for these. Uh, the first one is, um, oh, it disappeared on me, excuse me. Uh, what other cities do self-certification to this extent? Well, that was already asked, and we don't have it quite to this extent. Uh, obviously, uh, Phoenix is, is the biggest one. And remember, they're the fifth largest city in, in the country. And is theirs to the extent ours is, where any project that's, even though it's optional, any project that they wish to do uh, for self-certification, whether it be a water heater, re-roof, or a large development, um, do they do that as well? Well, remember, you still have to go through the same process for other things. You still have to go through the process of getting pre-approvals. Uh, you still, if you have something that requires going in front of the planning commission, you still have to do that. This is all about just you know the point in time where you're ready to submit the project after all the approvals are done. Okay. Do they still do the plan check? So what happens is the plan check is done up front. And what the planner does is they look at the paperwork and make sure that uh, they have a list of what's supposed to be included, including all the pre-approvals, including people signing off on it, including the peer review. And if all the paperwork is there, then they have a one day turnaround time to basically issue a permit. Okay. But do they see the plans? Oh yeah, sure they do. They have to. They inspect them to the degree that they need to? Before yeah, to the, ex to the extent they need to within that day. Because remember, everything has been, all the work has been done in advance. So you've got professionals who are, you know, licensed architects and civil engineers, folks that have been in business at least five years as, as a licensed architect or civil engineer are submitting completed plans. And what will happen is if they don't submit completed plans, their, their plan gets rejected and they have to go back through the old system. And you got to think, think about it this way. If you're an architect or civil engineer, you want to get these things through the first time because otherwise you're going to be waiting for months. No one wants to go through that. There's a big incentive to do this right from the beginning. Today, what you have is you kind of have this dance between uh, the architect and the city where they kind of go back and forth. And if I had more time, I'd tell you more about what are called 80% plans, which is what some of the architects call these things under the old system that we have today. Okay, well, uh, that being said, uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, call this one just because we're a few seconds out. And I do wanna say um, thank you, uh, Mr. Starr, and I will ask this of Mr. Nguyen as well. Any of these unanswered questions that we have, and there are some good ones that come in, would you be open to us submitting them to you and you can put out a response um, that can be uh, shared with folks um, out yeah. on social I, media? Or... I absolutely encourage people to submit questions. In fact, what we'll do is uh, if, if questions are asked frequently, we can add it to our FAQs on our website. So we definitely invite uh, the questions. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. All right, so what we're gonna do now is, um, oh, we've gone right into it. So now we're going to take 20 minutes to go over the next measure, which is measure L. Great, you ready? Sorry, I was, that was telling me our first 20 minutes was over. Yes, uh, go right ahead, sir. All right, so Measure L, which we call the Oxnard Fiscal Transparency and Accountability Act, or uh, we like to say it's fiscal transparency on steroids. So basically, the, one of the problems that we have in Oxnard is that we only get financial reports, true financial reports once per year. We're supposed to do a monthly technically, but we don't. Uh, the information is stale because it's, you don't see it till six months after the end of the fiscal year. And your information could be as much as 18 months old at that point. So, so the solution is to require monthly financial reporting with much more details than we have now, where you have comparisons between actual and budget, and you have forecasts into the future. And these will be presented to the city council and posted online. We're talking about more timely information. So another current problem we have is that you can't really see where the money is going. We have a solution for that. We're going to require that invoices, purchase orders, submitted bids, solicitations for bids and quotes all be posted online. 
So it isn't just the city saying, hey, we spent $100 on this particular reason. You get to see the actual invoice. And what this will help do is it's going to expose sweetheart deals. Because right now we do have sole source contracts. We have instances where you only have one bidder, where you got bidders that are being rejected for whatever reason. And I think you need to be able to see that information. So this is going to provide automatic transparency. You don't have to ask for the information. It's actually going to be out there. Another problem is that you can't tell whether the city operations are efficient or not. So the solution, we're going to have the CFO establish performance metrics for each department, one for costs, based on cost, one based on quality, another based on timeliness, because those are uh, goals that are in contention with each other. So those measurements we posted online, and the city council can require additional metrics beyond what the CFO is proposing. Another problem is that we've had huge problems with our finance, finances over these last few years. You know, three or four findings in an audit report is considered pretty bad. Well, in all the reports since 2014 in Oxnard, we've had 182 audit findings. That's just astounding. There is nothing out there like that. The state okay, controller's yes. office has been monitoring us. We've had six different CFOs in 10 years. We have a high rate of staff turnover. And we've had a history of malfeasance by top management. We all remember the story of a previous city manager who granted uh, benefits to employees, never told the city council about it because there's just no transparency of what's going on. So the conclusion is there's something really, really wrong. So the reason for this is because you have too much power under one person. The city manager controls all the information flow. The city manager can override internal controls because if somebody doesn't you know, do what he says, they can be fired and he can fire whistleblowers. The CFO reports to the city manager, not the public. There are no checks and balances. You never want to have this much power in one person. So the solution for that is you need to divide up the duties and that's what we're doing here. Basically the council will hire the city manager but the voters will hire the CFO. The city manager will oversee operations while the CFO prepares financial reports, uh, does uh, measure, uh, the measurements, uh, reports on department efficiency. The city manager will hire the finance department, including at least one or more CPAs. The CFO will be the one that supervises the department. The CFO will propose the annual budget, but it's the city council that approves, rejects, or modifies that budget. We'll have the CFO design the internal system of the system of internal controls so that our assets are safeguarded, but the council can order additional controls to place a check and balance on the CFO. One minute remaining. The council will hire an external the external auditor, while the CFO will hire the internal auditor, but the council can order the internal auditor to do additional reviews of what the CFO is doing. Oh. The CFO will oversee the whistleblower program but it's the city attorney and CFO combined that will report criminal acts to the city council and to law enforcement. So you don't have you know, problems being swept under the rug. Thank you. And open for questions and answers. Sorry, I thought it was off mute. Um, so thank you very much, Mr. Starr. Our uh, next... Um, uh, panelists who will be asking the questions from our planning group are Mr. Manuel Herrera and Ms. Alejandra Valencia. Hey, Mr. Stara, this is Manuel. Welcome to the forum. Hey, great to see you. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Okay, so here's your first question. Okay, so the city treasurer's qualifications are that they be at least 18 years old, a registered voter, and a resident of Oxnard. The qualifications for the CFO are at least a bachelor's degree in finance and accounting, eight years experience in finance, and three to five years of management experience. If the duties and responsibilities of the treasurer are increasing, why aren't the qualifications increasing? Well, state law determines what the qualifications are to serve in office. Um, so that's already decided by state law. But I want you to think about it this way. The question presumes that the voters don't know what they're doing. And Oxnard voters have a history of electing treasurers with a background in 
uh, business or finance and banking. Now there's also 170 elected treasure, city treasurers statewide. And I don't think you're ever gonna find anyone out there who's you know, some 18 year old who got elected as treasurer. It just doesn't happen. And the argument's a red herring that's being put out by the city. So this is the same requirements as to be on the city council, which adopts the budget. Uh, that is the same for the city clerk, the state assembly member has to be 18 years old. Uh, we're not gonna ever have an 18 year old governor, though I think he might have to be 21 to be governor. I mean, in theory, the city council could hire an 18 year old city manager, but they wouldn't. Uh, this isn't a real problem. It's a hypothetical that isn't going seconds. to happen. When the city manager makes this argument, he demonstrates he has a low opinion of the voters. Well, well that being the case then, if, um, if maybe the, the, the one solution would be to change the rules on that, you would have had the opportunity to do that in this measure, right? To change the qualification. So state law determines who can be, who can, uh, what the eligibility requirements are to serve in office. So one of the things that we did, because we did think about that, was, well, the problem is the city isn't even required to hire CPAs. So we required that the city hire one or more CPAs for the finance department. And remember, the city manager will continue to hire all the folks that are in the finance department and, you know, in the treasury department. There's like 35 people, I believe, combined. So in this weird, strange, bizarre world where we hire some 18 year old to supervise those folks, I just can't imagine that ever happening, but you're still gonna have 35 professionals that are hired by the city manager. I guess what, what scares some people is that, although the chances might be slim, it is possible. If uh, a lot of times uh, voters will, will base their votes on a popularity contest. And so, you know, so that's, that's that's why that question was brought up. It's been brought up a lot on social media. So, so thank you for your answer on that. Sure. Well, just have more confidence in the voters in Oxnard. We've got some pretty great people out here. Okay. okay so, uh, Mr. Starr, so the next question is going to be, um, the city treasurer's position is an elected one, meaning they cannot be fired. What happens if we end up selecting an ineffective city treasurer? Well, number one, you probably never uh, re-elect them. And I suppose in theory, you could recall them from office. And believe me, these days, city management has no problem with going out and beating up on an elected official to the point where uh, they may even consider resigning. So the word gets out pretty quickly when you have an incompetent person. And it seems like steps are always made to isolate that person. So. That seems to already happen at City Hall. And remember, he still has professionals working for him. He's gonna have 35 professionals working for him, hired by the city. So you gotta remember, most of these positions, some people think that the city manager, that the city mayor does all the work. He's just a figurehead for the most part. So a lot of the work gets done by the day-to-day -day employees that are actually there at City Hall. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Sure. Okay, uh, Mr. Starr, I, I wanna go back to that question if you don't mind. So, so okay. technically, if the answer is we just don't vote for them the next time. So if they're very ineffective, then we technically need to wait four years for them to mess up the city if, they're, if they turn out to be you know, bad CFOs. Oh. Well, I don't know, that doesn't sound like a question to me. Well, what's your comments on that? I mean, do you, that is possible, right? We because we can't fire them, so we'd have to just wait four years and let them do whatever they're going to do, and we got to wait it out. I mean, correct? So, I just look at the history. Oxnard voters are smarter than you're giving them credit for, and we've hired profession. You know, the Oxnard voters have hired professionals in the past. We've hired pretty capable people on the city council for the most part. And, you know, city council could also make blundering decisions too. Well, and, and a, a recall effort has already failed. So, you know. Yeah, well, well the, that's up to the voters, I suppose. You know, the voters can decide what they want. Okay. Um, but, but remember, remember, the city's gonna be required to hire one or more CPAs 
They weren't required to do that before. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, how is combining the two finance positions into one position gaining checks and balances? Wouldn't this do the opposite? For example, on your presentation, you said that right now there's too much power under one person. That's right. Well, by combining the two, you're giving all that power to one person. What we're doing is we're creating a check and balance against the city manager. Today, the city manager controls everything. So what okay. you want is you want you want somebody else who is answerable to the voters. Because the city manager controls all the information flow. He, he'll claim that the city council can fire him at any time. But you know what? If they don't get the information to know what's going on that's wrong, it'll never be exposed. And he won't get fired. But you know, all the people that work for the city manager aren't going to basically tell the city council what he's doing wrong because they'll, they'll get fired. When you've got an independently elected person like the city treasurer who is given the authority to create, you know, basically have the internal audits, uh, to have the uh, internal system of controls, all the safeguards, you have the opportunity to expose corruption. Today, you won't find corruption at City Hall because it won't it won't reach the light of day. So you need this because it's going to create an important check and balance. So it would seem that you're not really creating checks and balances. You're just switching the power. No, right? because it's still no, one person this, that has the power. This is a segregation of duties. You know, right now, remember, you got the CFO will supervise the finance department, but it's the city manager that hires them. You've got different, you, know, you don't want one person has control of everything. If you have all your eggs in one basket, you're going to have a problem. You need to split up the basket. Because right now, the CFO is going to provide whatever information, rather the city manager is going to provide whatever information that makes him look best to the council. That's just human nature. I would don't blame a city manager for doing that. It's just the way they're going to operate. This is human. These are human beings. You need other human beings who have similar levels of power in order to create a check and balance. It's similar to the federal government, right? You want to have a Congress. You want to have a presidency. You want to have a judicial branch. You want to have those checks and balances. And okay. Remember the, remember, the council can also order additional checks and balances themselves. Yeah. Okay. And, and I guess that question has expired. Let's go ahead and move on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, Mr. Starr, why are we combining the two to begin with? Why are we combining the two to begin with? I guess I don't really understand what the point of the question is. Basically, you want somebody who's an elected person. So what it does is that this creates an elected position who's the CFO. That's what it does. So you can't do that without combining it. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go to the Q&A portion here. We have about five minutes remaining in this item. Excuse me, uh, Gabe, there, there was one more question. Oh, I'm sorry, my, my apologies, Manuel, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, what other cities of similar size in California follow the same model that's in Measure N? So no other government is designed this way. And with the exception of Bell, no other city in California has had such hideous audit findings as Oxnard has had in recent years. So what other cities are doing is not working really well for us. So we need to do something different. You know, under state law, the starting premise is that cities elect their treasurers and that the treasurers, not the hired CFOs, are responsible for producing monthly financial reports. This is not an idea we invented. This is actually the default under state law. What happens is that the city councils up and down the state have decided to wrestle away that power from elected treasurers up and down the state. So this is actually the default, and we're just giving the treasurer more duties to make sure that he can provide more oversight. So if this has never been done elsewhere and basically Oxnard will be the guinea pig, isn't that a little scary? I mean, especially in the condition we're in right now with our finances, I mean, to take what some people might see this as a huge gamble and at the worst time. I mean, okay. what, what would you say to that? 
Have you seen our finance department these last six or seven years? It's not exactly working out for us. Right. So, but we're just going to just try something uh, absolutely new because it's never been done, right? I mean, this, this will be a first, right? It's always a first somewhere. And the bottom line is that what we have works horribly and has worked horribly for years. And while the same manager says we don't have any new findings, he doesn't want to tell you that we still have existing findings that haven't been cleaned up yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to go to the Q&A section here. And actually, the question I was going to pull from that was the one that uh, Mr. Herrera had asked. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, so looking at these questions, there's quite a few that have come in regarding this one. Uh, one is, do we have any proof of corruption or misconduct at City Hall? Is this a solution in search of a problem? Do we have proof of corruption at City Hall? Gosh, we had a DH report a while back that said there was lots of corruption at City Hall. You know, what, what year was that? I'm sorry. That was a number of years ago. But a number of years. Let, how many but, years, but, sir? But, but hold on a second. Is this a is this a question and answer or? A, no, I just want a clarification so that um, folks who are hearing the answer know how long ago that was. I think that was like in the 2012 uh, range, somewhere around there. But basic, uh, basically, uh, and I'm sorry. What was your question again? Because I I got caught. In, do we have evidence of corruption? So look. My apologies nope. on that. The question was, do we have any proof of corruption? I believe it's, is there existing corruption now or you misconduct at City Hall now? You don't, is this you a solution don't, in search of a problem? You don't have a mechanism to discover it. So look, the issue is you don't design systems where there are no checks and balances. When there are no checks and balances, you'll never discover the corruption. It'll be all under the table. So you want a system because of internal controls that works where you have checks and balances, where you've got segregation of duties, because otherwise people being who they are, people are not angels. You need to create a system based on the idea that some people in this world are not gonna be honest and don't take it on faith that everything's gonna work out well. And there's a lot of people that have questions about uh, how well the system, how well the city is run. There are no publicly published metrics on how well the departments are doing. We're going to provide a lot of transparency. You can't look at every invoice online today. What is so scary about transparency? Not Thank that. you, Mr. Stark. We, we want transparency. Thank you. The time has expired on that question. We have time for one last question, and it is, what if two 20-year-olds run for the position, or what if somebody unqualified runs unopposed? So it seems like a repeat of a previous question, but you know, as long as you're paying the treasurer enough money, you're going to attract people to serve in that position. So if you have a CFO who's making the money he's making today as an elected position, you will attract lots of qualified people. The idea that no one's gonna run for a job that pays well just doesn't seem very likely. Thank you. We have just a few seconds left. I think you said something really great on that. Um, how much would that be? How much do you think they would be getting paid? Uh, I don't know what the CFO is getting paid right now, but he gets well, he gets paid well. So that we would raise a city treasurer's uh, pay rate to that amount. Well, remember, you're combining the two positions. So would we double their amount or would we combine it, meet in the middle? The, what, what would that look like? And it's going to be up to the city. City Council is going to have to decide whether, you know, what role Kevin Riper, for example, is going to play. Okay, I only bring that up because um, there's certainly a lot of great discussion around how much city officials are paid. And if we had the city treasurer come in and become one of the higher paid positions in the city, and sure, we could attract uh, people to run for that position, but um, we're already having discussions around, around city officials pay, yep. and they make much more than any of the council members. Is that correct? Oh, there's lots of there's lots of discussion. Of course, you even you even have a council member that right now that gets a wonderful pension each year, about 180 grand a year. Is that from their city role? I'm sorry, what? It was from, their, previous, from their city council role to get that? As, no, it was for his previous work uh, with the city. Oh, previous work. Yep. It's not the city council role. Nope, not the city council role. Okay. Okay, so our time has expired for that measure. Thank you, everybody, much.
And we will uh, go ahead and move on now to our next measure, which is measure M. And uh, Mr. Starr, I'll go ahead and start your timer again. Great, thank you. So our next uh, measure is measure M. It's the Oxnard Open Meetings Act. It's about having meetings at reasonable times, having more information made public in advance and having expanded opportunities for public comment. So a little bit of background here. So the city council used to meet, have all their meetings in the evenings, but starting in January of 2019, they changed it. They created a committee system where on alternating Tuesdays, they have meetings starting at like roughly 9 a.m. in the morning, uh, all the way through the, the entire day. Uh, today, we have oral staff meetings, presentations that are made, and sometimes they blindside the public. There's information that is not always available in the written reports that are presented at the time when the oral staff presentation is made. Sometimes these staff presentations run so long that there are folks that want to go home and take care of, you know, dinner and their kids, put them to bed, they have to get up for work the next day. So it really reduces public participation. And the mayor can reduce public comment uh, time down to, you know, a minute per person. That's at his discretion. And finally, the meetings are really poorly run. They're inefficient. Uh, we've seen instances where the mayor has prohibited debate among council members. I remember one instance where Burke Corello tried to make a motion and he was shouted down. Uh, this is really not the way to run a meeting. So our solutions are that we think that meetings should be at accessible times. It needs to be in the evenings after 5 p.m. on weekdays. And it needs to be after 9 a.m. on weekends if they ever choose to have meetings on a weekend. Now there's gonna be exceptions. So if you're an advisory committee, like a CAG, you're not subject to this rule. If there is an emergency meeting of the council, they don't have to meet at 5 p.m. If there are closed sessions, uh, if there's meetings conducted outside of Oxnard, or if there's some extenuating circumstance where four fifths of the council says, hey, we can't possibly meet at this time, we have to meet at this other time, they can do that. Uh, another solution we have is that the staff presentations will be pre-recorded and available in advance. We propose that they be published on the website and available at City Hall for those that don't have internet access. Uh, the public will be informed sooner of what's going on. It gives them more time to research and to formulate questions, not just for the public, but the council as well. And it leaves more time for public comment because when the when the actual, at the actual council meeting, the staff isn't re-enacting the uh, presentation. They're simply there for, primarily to answer questions. And this will provide more time for meaningful council deliberations. Measure M also expands the opportunity for public comment. Instead of having one minute to speak, you will have three minutes to speak on each subject that is on the agenda. Uh, it will also give you as a member of the public the right to speak on a subject that was considered earlier by a council committee. Right now under the Brown Act, if a council committee has a hearing on a subject, they are not legally obligated to provide you with any time for speaking on it when it comes before the full council. Uh, moreover, this motion, this uh, ordinance requires that the public have access to the same sort of visual aids that the council, that the city staff does. So that way you can do a PowerPoint presentation at the meeting or present video or pictures. Uh, this measure requires the use of Robert's rules. Now Robert's rules was the policy of Oxnard all the way up until 2019. I don't know how many decades it's been the policy here. They didn't know how to use it correctly, but it's been our policy. Now, Robert's Rules is the most widely used meeting rules manual in the US. It's been around for 144 years. It protects the rights of the minority during meeting debate. The One minute remaining. The city, man the city mayor will not be able to shout somebody down. Each member of the council has equal rights to speak. And when used correctly, this facilitates efficient meetings, whether, whether the meeting is friendly or contentious, you want Robert's rules there in place to make that happen and to make sure that the council knows how to use Robert's rules and all the legislative bodies know how to use Robert's rules. This, this is going to require that they be trained by a certified professional. So this criticism that I heard, this does not dismantle council committees and only requires that they meet in the evenings. 
It's not going to cost a lot more because it takes just as much time to record a staff meeting prior to the meeting as it does at the meeting. And finally, it doesn't even mandate oral staff presentations. If there needs to be one, the staff can provide one. If they, if not, they don't have to. A written report can be, often be sufficient if it's presented correctly. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Our panelists who will be asking these questions from our planning team are uh, Mr. Dave Ebbett and Diana Velsey. And By the way, Star you've got great questions and thank you so much. Mr. Starr, the first question we have that came in was, does the city already provide parliamentary training? No, they do not. Okay. How will the public have equitable access to these videos? Especially, okay. the, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, are you talking about the presentations at the uh, yes. city staff? They'll, yes. be posted on the, they'll be posted on the website at the same place where the staff uh, uh, agendas and uh, written presentations are. And if somebody doesn't have access to the internet, they can go down to the city library and view it there, or go to city, city hall and view it there themselves. So this, this ordinance requires that it be made available, not just on the internet, but also for those that want to see it in person. And then by the way, there's nothing that stops the city from playing these videos on channel 35 if they want to. They can do it before the meetings and that way people can see it that way as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next question I think you've already answered and it was, wouldn't this push the city meetings later into the evening if they are all required to start at 5 p.m.? Well, and remember we, that, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. And then on that topic, um, wouldn't this cause the city overtime for some of these people? Actually, you might have less overtime, I'll tell you why. Because you're doing the presentations in the middle of the work, uh, the middle of the work, normal work day, and you're recording them. So if you have any hourly employees that are at a council meeting, I don't think there's very many of them, but you know, right now, if they don't have to be at a late city council meeting, you're actually gonna cut down over time. So re remember that council meetings, uh, you, you know, used to all start at six. This allows them to start as early as five. So it allows them to get started up an hour earlier than typically they do now. Uh, the, meeting, the, the meetings themselves will actually probably be shorter because the staff presentations are pre-recorded. So this leaves more time for public comment, more time for council deliberation, and you actually end up having a shorter, more effective meeting. And by requiring that the council members get training, professional training on how to run an efficient meeting, you won't have the types of long meetings that you have today. So you want, you want a meeting that is run well, where everyone gets to seconds. speak and where the information is provided to everybody in advance. And that's what the intention here is beyond measure M. Okay, thank you. This measure requires that all public comments be no less than three minutes long. The budget meeting from June, 2019 had well over 100 comments from the public. Had everyone been, uh, been given the three minutes and used that full amount of time, the public comment period alone would have been five hours long. Um, since the measure also states that no meetings may start prior to 5 p.m. and meetings must allow at least three minutes for each public comment, won't this push, won't this push large important meetings like the 2019 budget meeting well into the late evening hours? How is this not making the meeting less access accessible to the public who cannot view or attend that late? Remember, it's, it's the rare subject that is con so controversial that you drive large numbers of public speakers to a meeting. Most meetings you're going to find are going to be shorter, give more opportunity for the public to speak, you have, uh, more uh, you know, effective deliberation, but when you do have a controversial meeting, you do want people to have that opportunity to speak. I mean, at county supervisor meetings, you have lots of people that speak. Sometimes you might have 100 people speak. But you don't, the last thing you want to do in a democracy is shut off the opportunity for people to speak. And it's really difficult to do that 
uh, to speak effectively in one minute. Now, some people can, but maybe long-winded people like me can't. But most, a lot of people don't use up their full three minutes. You know, so there are some people that just want to say, hey, this is my opinion, and I hope you'll vote this way, and they're done. But you know, if you really want short meetings, I suppose you could ban public comments altogether, but you would never want to do that. I think that you should have open access uh, for people to uh, attend meetings and to speak out. And I think that the meetings are overall are going to be shorter, more informative, and you're going to have more people able to attend. Right now, you have a lot of meetings that happen in the middle seconds. of the workday. And meetings that happen in the middle of the workday are rarely attended by the public. What you have today is a really, really bad situation, and this will make it much, much better. Thank you. Uh and right. oh, go ahead, Dave. The next question that was inquired was, would there be like a way that people who are working would be able to see these council meetings that have to get up and go to work and they've got to go to bed early? So how would they be able to interact or keep up with these meetings? So let me see if I understand your question quickly. You're asking if, if people have to go to work early. Yes, and, and the meetings are starting at night in okay. the evening and they go till later. Some of these meetings go until 10, 11, 12 o'clock. How would the public be able to be a part of if they're concerned about the issues at hand? So, so right now you have a problem now at normal city council meetings where they run too long and and that's a problem. And, but the way you fix that is by getting more information to the public in advance. So that way you can have shorter meetings. So I mean, right now you still have city council meetings on alternate Tuesdays in the evenings. So we're not changing that. Uh, we're saying that you can actually meet an hour earlier. Uh, these will be shorter meetings. So it'll be actually easier to get to bed earlier. Because right now, candidly, I've seen instances where staff has put on a presentation and it's pretty much a filibuster is what it is. It's meant to basically wear out the public so that, they will go, so that they will go home. And they do. I've seen that with the uh, increase of the wastewater rates back in 2016. I remember they dragged that out for two hours and people were really upset and they wanted to speak about that. So this is going to create result in less game playing and more access for the folks to speak. And I think we're going to have a much better situation than we have today where you got meetings in the middle of the workday and people can't attend. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have about seven minutes left in this item. Uh, looking at a uh, follow-up to one thing you had mentioned, Mr. Starr, um, with the uh, council meetings being every other week with the committee meetings, you said they weren't being dismantled. The committee meetings would also have to start at 5 p.m.? Yeah, sure, or they can do it on the weekends. So if they want to meet several days, they can. If they want to meet on the weekends, they can. They just have to make sure that they meet at a time that's available to the public. Because otherwise, what you have, you have what you have today, which is very few members of the public attend. Thank you. And when you say that they can start as early as five, does that include closed session items? Closed session items can, be, can begin before five. Thank you very much. They're, 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 they're specifically exempted in, in, the, uh, in the ordinance. OK. So we have a question here in the Q&A portion, which says Ventura County does their meetings during the day. I believe they mean the Board of Supervisors. Sure. So Ventura County does their meetings during the day and they adjust the speaker time based on the number of people. Isn't mm -hmm. Oxnard more open since the final decision on items is made at evening city council meetings every other week? So remember, under state law, they don't even have to let you speak on an item that went in front of the a council committee. So we want to ensure that you have the right to speak. So your best chance for influencing the city council is your best chance for influencing the, the, the proposals first at the council committee meeting, because that's where most of the work gets done and you got three people that are already committed to a, a position. But right now, when you go to that city council meeting, they don't have to let you speak on that subject and they can make a decision without your input at all, that we need to close that loophole. Thank you. So um, that was the only question I see in regards to this item. If I can go ahead and ask one real quickly. Um, sure. 
I actually, uh, as, um, this isn't promotion, but just a statement, just I have created videos um, just based on things that go on in the city. And um, for me, I will sit down, I'll study the information, I'll uh, figure out what I'm going to say, I'll present it on camera, and then I'll edit it, and then I'll post it. For me, uh, I feel like at the very low, um, the low level technology videos that I put out, um, I easily put in uh, an hour's work of worth of time into every minute to two minutes of video. And so um, it's not an easy job to do. I'm wondering, do you, how would the videos look for the city stuff? How do you envision that happening? Is that them presenting and editing? Who would do that role too? So basically, hopefully these folks are rehearsing before they ever uh, come to a meeting. So right now uh, you see them rehearsing, right now you see them rehearsing at, at council committees. They go through these dry runs. Uh, I know the previous city manager used to have presentations made to him before it went to the full uh, council. So there seems to be plenty of opportunities to rehearse and give a good presentation. You want them to invest that information up that time up front to give a effective presentation that doesn't drag on forever. I think you're gonna have more effective presentations if they know they're going to be recorded and they record them in advance. If they make a mistake, they can uh, re-record it and start over, I suppose. So I don't know. I think that um, lots of people give speeches and presentations and some people are pretty good at it and some people really struggle with it. But we don't edit the council meetings. So Great, anyway, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. Um, we'll go ahead and move forward. <laughs> it was okay. It, it was a it was a, co a pretty complex question, but just knowing my own personal experience in um, filming and editing things, it just seems to me that if I were a city staff member, I had to spend that time. When would I do my other work? Well, remember, you're you're doing the work right now at the council meeting itself, right? If you're a member of staff, you're giving that presentation at the city council meeting. So that's live. There's no opportunity to edit it. Uh, instead, we're just going to have you do it during your work day. And you're going to provide it, you know, in advance so people can actually see it. You really want the information to be out there in advance. You don't want to be, you don't want the public to be blindsided with new information. You want the full information to be out there so that the public can see it, so they can check the veracity of the claims that are made in these presentations. I've seen instances where uh, I'm at a staff council meet, I'm at a city council meeting, and the presentation says something, I go, wait a minute, that's not right. And I'm desperately trying to look up on the internet for the answer right then and there. And sometimes I can find it in time to give a public comment. But I'd much rather be able to well, see something at my leisure, you know, a week, a week in advance, and be able to investigate it and come prepared to a meeting. Thank you. And one last follow up to that. Sure. With the staff you had mentioned, they would film it ahead of time and the council sees it, the public sees it. And then are they still having to be at the evening council meetings as well? So their, answer prim questions? their primary purpose is to answer questions. So there won't be a reenactment of their presentation. That'd be a waste of time. And would it be incumbent on the public to see it ahead of time if they want to see the presentation? They wouldn't be able to see it live at the council meeting? Well, what they can do is there's nothing that stops the city council from playing those pre-recorded meetings, uh, presentations ahead of time on, on the public access channel. So, so. Yeah, and so we have to know when those are going to air in order to sit down and watch them, correct? Because they wouldn't be on demand. They could, they, they certainly could be on demand. They could be on the internet. So the idea is that the video would be there at the same location as the agenda and the staff report. So you can play it at your leisure. So you don't have to do it at a specific time. Do it at the middle of the night if you want to. Do it at your leisure time. Yes. Or as you mentioned, if someone doesn't have internet, they can go down to City Hall and watch it, correct? Ab absolutely. And you've got people that don't have cable TV either, I suppose, and they can't even watch the City Council meetings. But they can still go to a, at least we used to be able to go to a city council meeting and watch it in person. But you, nothing, nothing stops you from going to City Hall and seeing the presentation yourself. Thank you. Sure. There is one final question that came in, but I'm not sure if we can answer it. Um, it says, is there a hotline that 
people can call into to listen in while they're driving home or while they're driving home or getting off work? I mean, a hotline to listen to what? I guess to the council meetings. I would say, I, I think, know. you know, this is not a, um, a suggestion or an endorsement, but if someone, you know, you can hear them on YouTube without viewing the video, but with your driving home, I would not suggest having YouTube on your can, phone. Can, can, can you, I don't know if you can stream these meetings onto your, your phone if you want to, to at least listen to it. I don't know. I don't, I don't pretend to know what the technology is set up for that. And someone at City Hall can probably better answer that question, but it has nothing to do with my measure. Okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go on to our final item of the evening. Thank you for that for Measure M. Thank you. By the way, great questions. And I hope that you're finding that my answers uh, are, are satisfactory, at least that they're answering the questions. You may not agree with them, but I hope, hope you think that I'm answering your questions. <clears throat> Thank you. So we have Measure N now, and uh, Mr. Starr, go ahead and present whenever you're ready. All right, Measure M, which is the Keeping Promise for Oxnard Streets Act. Basically, it requires that the city fix the streets. If they do, we keep paying Measure O. And if they don't fix the streets, we stop paying Measure O. Kind of a fundamental concept here. If you don't do your job, your employer is going to stop paying you. And we think that same standard should apply to the city. So back in 2008, uh, City Hall pretty much sweet-talked voters into adopting a half percent sales tax increase. And the city promised, quote, to protect, maintain, and enhance vital city services. And they included in their list, increasing street paving and sidewalk uh, puddle repair. Great deal, right? Well, here's the reality. Uh, our streets are not getting better. They're actually worse than they were in 2008. So that was, uh, by the way, Fifth Street. So there's an objective measure of street quality known as the pavement condition index. It's a numerical score between zero and 100. 100 would be a brand new street, zero would be you know, gravel. Uh, it's a measurement that's used throughout the country. It's an objective measurement. So let's look at what the city has claimed in the past versus what they claim now when there's a political fight. Now, in the past, looking at this 2017 staff report from City Hall, they said that the, at, that the ideal pavement condition index should be around 75 to 80, and that you're in a critical PCI range if you're between you know, 70 and 55. So notice where our streets and our alleys are going. Since 2008, the alleys get worse, 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 and worse. Our streets are no better. In fact, they're worse since 2008. It's a bad thing. So same staff report, they talk about what does it cost to actually maintain the existing pavement condition index? So back in 2017, they said, we need to spend $12.3 million per year just to maintain the existing street surface in the bad condition it's in. So what's happened since 2008? Well, dropped, it never really recovered. It's always been pretty much below what's necessary to maintain the streets at even their bad levels today. In 2016, there was another staff report where they discussed how much does it cost to maintain a street at a relatively high quality? You'd spend either a dollar now or later on you can spend $8 if you wait long enough. We're kind of on this slope down here and it's getting more and more expensive the longer you wait. So at the same council meeting, uh, they said, what does it actually cost to regularly maintain a street? If you maintain it, sorry, if you maintain it, uh, then you're gonna find that you're gonna spend $2.85 per square foot over the life cycle of the street and have an average pavement condition index of 79. But if you do the bare minimum as far as, as, far as maintenance goes and you let, you let the street decay, like you can see on the red line, you're gonna get bad streets and spend a lot more. You're gonna spend $4.54 per square foot and have an average pavement condition of, of only 68, which is actually better than what we have now. So basically it's, you get cheaper streets in the long run if you actually maintain them, just like if you maintain your car. So that was the city saying that. That wasn't me saying that, that was the city saying that back in 2016, 2017. So what are they saying now? They're saying it costs more, not less, to maintain streets at the ideal PCI range of 75 to 80. They say that the PCI goal should be 70, that that should be fine. But before they said that was critical. 
they say they can't afford to fix the streets, even with the extra sales tax, even though they promised to uh, pay for it before. And the reality is that other cities that do not have a separate sales tax, many of them maintain their streets better than we do. This is a 2018 staff report from Camarillo where, the, where their PCI was running at 78. So the reality is that you either pay now or you pay even more later. And we can't afford not to repair the streets or else you're gonna pay much more later. So measure N requires that you increase the uh, payment condition index over time or measure O sunsets. If you achieve these higher rates, these higher standards, then the city council can extend for five-year increments uh, this uh, payment condition index. So it doesn't save you money to never change the oil in your car. And it doesn't save you money to refuse to fix the city streets. If you maintain a payment condition index of 80, you have the lowest overall cost. And that will free up more money in the budget for other services that we desperately need. So don't cheat yourself by having bad streets, having no money, and then nothing left to pay for other services. We need to do the right thing and fix our streets. Great, thank you very much. For the uh, question and answer portion for Measure N, we have Yolanda Solorio and Manuel Herrera. Hello, Mr. Starr. Uh, this is Manuel again. Hey, Manuel. I'm back. You're back. Good to see you. Okay, so um, here's, I'll be actually be asking the first two questions. So sure. the first question, it has been stated that the, that meeting the PCI, the pavement oh. condition index, by the dates imposed would be mathematically impossible. For example, it has been estimated that it will cost approximately $17 million a year to reach a PCI of 65 by the year 2022. And yet Measure O only brings in about 16 to 17 million a year, maybe even less now due to COVID. So based on those estimates, isn't it mathematically impossible to meet uh, uh, PCI uh, 65? So just because the city told you a number, it doesn't mean that it's true. The city has a long track record of giving the public false data when it serves their political purposes. And the city acts like they have that they have the option of spending nothing on street maintenance if not for measure uh, N. So let me uh, show you another slide from even just as recently as 2020. Here, they say that regardless of what happens with measure N, and it wasn't measuring at the time, the city will be required to increase funding for roads over the next 12 years. But look at that first column there of numbers. They say, if you don't spend any money at all, what happens to your streets? It drops from 64 to 46 in eight short years. It, the alleys drop from 31 to 18 in eight short years. It's not like you have the option of spending no money at all. So basically, uh, I think that the city is just gonna to have to get better at spending money. And remember, lots of cities don't have a measure of. Somehow they spend money out of their general sales tax, out of their general fund to keep their roads up. We have some of the worst roads in this county is right here in Oxnard. And it's because of just frankly, poor care. You know, they wanna spend the money elsewhere is really what the bottom line is. They don't want to repair the roads. Many of the city employees don't even have to bear with the roads, so they don't even live here in Oxnard. 10 seconds. So, so the, the estimate of 17 million a year you're saying is incorrect, then, then what, what's the right figure? I'm saying that the city likes to tell you figures to basically manipulate you. And what's more important is what did they say in the past when there wasn't a political fight? Now, the bottom line though is their past slides show that if you don't spend the money, you will spend more in the long run. It's not like you have the option of not fixing your streets. You've got to fix your streets or you're going to spend more money in the end. You know, we're at 63 now. The first step is to get to 65. And remember their last, that, that uh, one of the slides I showed that they said that they need 12.3 million just to stay even, just to stay even. So if you spend a few million dollars more to get to 65, that's not bad. At least we'll get better streets. Well, and you you mentioned Camarillo, but 
Mm-hmm. To be fair, Camarillo brings in more money because sure. the real estate, they're a newer city and so forth. So, I mean, right? So remember this. The, the city manager likes to talk about how old this city is versus other cities. Yeah, you go back to 1970, our city was one third the size that we are now. We've tripled in size since 1970. Uh, the other cities, Camarillo, Thousand Oaks, they pretty much quadrupled in size since then. Streets don't last more than 25 years. They just don't. So this whole idea that we have an old city is a red herring because unless you want to compare with a city that's less than 25 years old, I mean, if you had to say it was less than 25 years old, I would, I would grant the city manager the argument. That's not what we have here. We have streets that decay, that have to be repaired more frequently than 25 years. My own street out here where I live, some of the streets nearby, I mean, this, this housing complex was built in 2004. Williams Street is just horrible. And that's not 25 years even. So you got a bunch of streets that are just not being repaired. And you know it's just not acceptable. And it's not because we're an old city. It's because we don't take care of our streets. OK, thank you. Uh, the second question, mm-hmm. how is it possible to catch up in the PCI? You're going to have to rededicate your resources elsewhere. I had a conversation once uh, with the uh, person who was in charge, and gosh, his name escapes me, but he was in charge of the Port Wainimi uh, repairs. Now remember, Port Wainimi has a similar situation to us. A drive on Channel Islands Boulevard and the Port Wainimi part, and it's well maintained. And I asked him about that. How do you do that? And he described the process that they went through to be on top of their streets and make sure they're well maintained. And the city of Oxnard doesn't do that. They don't care. And because they don't care, because they get the money, whether you, they're getting the money, whether they perform the service or not. And we need to make sure that if they're going to get the money, they need to provide the service, just like you with your job. Okay, thank you. Um, Yolanda? Yeah. So my question would be that Measure O funds a number of important general services, you know, such as Fire Station 8 and 2. Why should we dedicate it fully towards alleys and roads at the cost of cutting these other services? So let me ask you this question. How much of Camarillo's Measure O should go towards streets? How much of Thousand Oaks's Measure O should go towards streets? How much of 200 some odd cities in California gave for their measure up for streets? The answer is zero because they don't have a measure up. And yet somehow they're maintaining their streets better. Remember, measure O is just money going into the general fund. It is no different than any other tax, whether it's the city business license or the property tax. At the end of the day, it all, it all goes into the general fund. It is just a bookkeeping entry that they're doing to make you think Measure O is a separate thing. It's not. Mm-hmm. And by the way, we don't even require that Measure O money be used for this. They can use the general fund for this. There are creative ways to fix the streets that don't require as much output from the city coffers. For example, there are, there are streets that are in industrial areas where I know businesses that would love to take ownership of those streets and take care of them themselves because the city's just so horrible at it. That's what that says. It's there to get better streets and be smart about it. We can go for grants from city from the state. We the city council urged us to vote for the sales for the gasoline tax increase or not to repeal it because we'd get this money and obviously it's not really coming here. That's not right. So my final question would be, if the PCI PCI is not met and Measure O sunsets, what is your plan to continue to fund the general services that will have to be cut without that revenue? So remember, other cities are better managed than ours. Let me me give you an example. I'm going to bring up the big elephant in the room. I want to show you something. This is the public safety expense in various cities around the county. Look at Port Wainimi, Camarillo, Thousand Oaks, and Simi Valley. This is their annual expense on public safety. And this is their population for each. 
Look at the per capita expense for each of these cities. On average, they're spending about $276 per person on public safety and they keep their cities relatively safe. Somebody needs to ask the question. I don't have the answer yet, but somebody at least needs to ask the question, why does it take $110 million on public safety at $525 per capita when other cities on average are spending about half of that? If we were able to spend equivalent to other cities, we'd have a lot of money saved for other purposes. We are really poor at management. I'm not, I'm not impressed with a manager that just says, I need more money. I want a manager that says, I know how to spend the money better so I can get more bang for the buck. That's what we do where I work. We always figure out ways to get more from less. And that's why we're productive and we're one of the most successful companies around. That type of mindset needs to take place at City Hall and it doesn't. Hey, Mr. Starr, this is Manuel again. I have a follow up question. Sure. So let's say measure in passes. Yep. And let's say that the city, because they don't have the money, they fail to meet you know, the standards. So then measure, measure O goes away, correct? Yep. And let's say measure E fails. Yep. And that would have been extra uh, revenue. Yep. So then what are we going to do? If there's no money in measure O, no money from measure E, what's the city to do? So this is the reason why you want to pass our other measures. So measures F, L, and M. Measure F is going to bring in more revenue to the city because you're going to be able to bring in more businesses to city hall or more to the city rather. They can employ people. When you employ more people, there's less demand on services. It's a less costly city when more people are employed. There's more revenue from the city business license taxes and from all the enhanced property taxes and the increased sales tax revenue from that. We are a poor city because we chase away business. Other cities have captured opportunities that we have failed to capture. I mean, years ago, we had the opportunity to put an outlet mall out here and we lost that battle. Who got it? Camarillo. Camarillo gets a lot of money because they're not chasing away the business. So as long as City Hall chooses to chase away businesses, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna struggle. We need to change our mindset at City Hall. And okay, the, reason why you want measure, the reason why you want Measure L is you wanna make it so that everybody can see where the money's being spent. Because if the, city, if the money's being spent poorly, you're gonna have a better opportunity to see that so we can spend the money better. Right now, okay. it's just not visible. Mr. Star, yeah, I'm sorry. I said, I don't wanna run out of time here. So okay. with all due respect, you said, well, if my measures pass, there's your money. Well, if Measure E passes, they're saying uh, that'll be about $40 million. Measure O currently brings in around $17 million. So are you saying that if your measures pass, we're going to make that much money back? You know, over time, we're going to figure out ways to make uh, money back. And candidly, uh, seeing how poorly the city spends money, I think that we can spend money better. I mean, just, you know, let me put it this way. Before Measure O, we survived as a city. For decades, we were around, we ran a city without a Measure O. Many cities have no measure O. What the city manager wants to do is double our current city tax rate from 1.5% to 3%. It is the highest city tax in the state. There are only two cities in California, Santa Cruz and Watsonville, that charge their residents 3%. Why is it that you have all these cities up and down the state that are able to manage their business, manage their affairs without, with, with the base rate of 1%. There's 262 cities that have just the base rate of 1%. They manage it. We can manage it. We used to manage it. We can do better. I expect us to do better and we will do better. You know, a lot of, a lot of people on, on social media say, hey, we just need to live within our means, right? That's that's the answer. Let's just live within our means. That's right. But we have been living within our means, and this is what we have: is have no roads, seen? no roads being fixed. You know, the weeds are bad. So uh, I, I get what you're saying, and 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 trust me, you know, I we need fixes, we need changes, we definitely, definitely need to do something to get out of this mess. So, so the, the, the average employee 
the, the, the median employee at City Hall makes $106,000 a year with benefits. That's really high. We have, that means half of the employees are making more than that. We have supplemental pension plans beyond what CalPERS offers that are being given to many, many, many of the employees. We have an extra property tax here in Auction Array, the Carmen Override, very few cities have that. We are way overtaxed. We're like a spendthrift city. You've got people in life and we've all met them that it seems like that no matter how much money they have, how much they bring in, they're always broke. That's Oxnard. Oxnard doesn't know how to manage themselves. The city doesn't know how to manage itself. We need better management. I live that where I am today. I live, I, I figure out how to make a, to, I can stretch a quarter to the point where George Washington grimaces. You have to be smart with your money because you will never fix this problem with more money. They thought they would fix the problems with measure O. It didn't work. And it's not gonna work with measure uh, E either. Measure E will increase the money. And what will happen is that within a year or two, we're going to boost up the salaries and pensions of our employees to the point where we're saying, hey, we're just doing it to keep up with the Joneses. It's like an arms race, but you'll never win that arms race because if any other city raises their rates, they're gonna pay their employees more. Well, guess what? You're back to where you started. This needs to stop. This needs, the throwing money at this problem is never going to fix it. We need to manage our resources better. We can't tax- Our, our time has expired on that question. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. We're, we're taxing poor people to death here. Thank you very much. So uh, our time has expired for measure N, but I had typed into the chat earlier that we will be revisiting questions from the questions and answers box that have not been answered yet. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Alex Ray Rivera and Alejandra Valencia to take this portion. By the way, thank you for all the great questions. So far. Thank you. I should clarify too, these will be for either Mr. Nguyen or Mr. Starr. And we asked people, please put uh, which measure you are um, directing your question toward. Thank you, Gabe. Um, I have seen some questions come in through the chat. So I want to start with the city manager. Uh, thank you for to both you and Aaron for giving these great responses. So, so there was a question about the public safety budget. There was a figure there, 110 million. Mr. City Manager, that's, is, that, is that high? That, um, uh, is that relative to other city departments? Um, how can we do more with less? Uh, does that number, as Mr. Starr pointed out, seem to be too high? So it's actually in line with many other cities that are full service cities, meaning cities that have their own fire departments and their own uh, police department. So some of the cities that Mr. Starr were comparing us to actually utilize the sheriff's department yep. and in some cases perhaps even county fire. So it's a little bit different there. Now in terms of why the budget seems so high, what's happened since Prop 218 is city general fund budgets have actually shrunken in size. And what's happened there is the portion for public safety because of the overall shrinkage, the public safety portion grows larger, but over time, when you look at it, it's growing at a steady rate. Because of Prop 218, there are many things we can't just do through taxes anymore that we have to do through fees. I mean, a lot of the economic development activity, all of that is fee-driven versus just coming out of a tax. So there's, there's unintended consequences from some of those propositions. It's the system we have, it's the system we work in. Now, one other thing to keep in mind is no matter what city or what town that you're responsible for, public safety is the utmost priority. That's the bottom line. Yep. So when you compare our city to some of these other cities, we are a large city. We have over 200,000 people here. We have urban Thank issues. Here. We have certain issues here that some other cities don't have to deal with, don't have to So, so very that's quickly, important. very that's quickly, what, just to uh, respond to you, sir, is there uh, any savings opportunities if we subbed out certain departments looking at the county for a service provider? Do you see a value in that? Are, are you, so are you, do you mean public safety? Well, any, any department service that we could gain from, uh, you just mentioned it, so I wanted to ask you. Uh, so, I'm, the so I'm, 
as a city manager, I'm agnostic about insourcing or outsourcing. So it depends on where, where you can get the best service for the bang of your buck. It's bottom line. So I'm not opposed to outsourcing anything, but it has to make sense. But when it comes to public safety, because I've dealt with this before, you don't want to outsource that for a city of this size because you lose control over your labor rates. That's number one. And we've learned that lesson very well um, with just the animal shelter costs. You lose control over labor rates. We are no longer negotiating for labor rates. You also lose control over the requirements and how fast you can and can't keep up with the capital improvements for police stations, fire stations, police cars, and so on. So even when you outsource it, you're still paying for it. You have a lot less control over it. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, for bringing up the labor rates, because that's another question. Uh, will you be releasing the 2019 employee compensation data as requested to the state controller and transparent uh, California before the election? Uh, because I think uh, people are wondering where that is. So we sent so we sent them the info. Then they had clarifying questions, and we've actually responded to them. So now it's on them to publish it. But we have sent them all the clarifying questions they asked. So the and transparent is and transparentcalifornia.com. Uh, no, we send it to the state, and then transparent gets it from there. Well, I think the da data is actually different. The the state uh, actually hides and only shows the rank of the employee and not the name and Transparent California actually puts more information. So it's separate. Then, then if, if, they, if they have gotten it from Oxford in the past, they'll get it again. And will it be for the, before the election? Uh, that I don't know. I can find out. Okay, thank you. Ali? I kind of wanted to revisit a, a question that was on for measure N. So for measure N, as far as streets, which streets will get priority? Um, will any of the South Oxnard streets be neglected and be focused on last? So the nice thing about a pavement condition index is that it's a measurement of the entire street network. So if you got streets that are in really poor condition, those ones you can upgrade and actually have the biggest impact on your pavement condition index. So if the streets are particularly poor in South Oxnard, let's say, it might be worthwhile in some cases for the city to dedicate more resources there. It really depends on, it'll really be up to the city manager in this case to decide which streets are going to get attention. So that's something that Measure M doesn't uh, dictate. Or I'm sorry, Measure M. And okay, uh, Mr. City Manager, what, what will happen uh, next, if the city isn't able to get the revenue that it needs, you say to keep up with the expenses, if Measure E fails, uh, will you stick around? Are you going to um, look at your options like uh, Rick Cole from Santa Monica did? Like who? What? Uh, if Measure E doesn't pass. No, no, I heard that. At around? the end, you said like who? Uh, Rick Cole from Santa Monica when he left his city because of the current uh, budget. Uh, forecast being very, very uh, detrimental to city services and cuts. Okay, so uh, I'm actually uh, intending on sticking around. Great. And, and Aaron, for you, if your measures fail and you're not successful, what would you, what, it's hard to know what your thoughts would be, but what would you be thinking next? I guess I'll cross that bridge when I get there. But, you know, when, when I first ran for city council, people said, oh, you're just gonna go away. And you're gonna be like every other council candidate that doesn't actually make it. Well, you know, I stuck around. I've stuck around every year since then and I wanna to continue to contribute to my community and make it a better place in the best way that I know how. So hopefully uh, my wife and I will continue to uh, do great things for Oxnard, or at least we hope they're, at least let, we Let me ask you, we can go. Aaron, let me ask you, why do you commit so much time and all your personal money to fight the, you know, the fights that you're fighting? Why, why, do, why do you put, why are you all in with all that money? So, uh, you know, my wife and I, we, we don't have children and that's not an option on the table. And so we kind of see Oxnard as our extended family and we're going to do whatever we need to do to uh, make sure that our family's taken care of. So, how much um, have you been taking care of? What can you give us a figure of how much you've all of these legal challenges, your your time, your costs? Well, I mean, I can tell you that the city has sued me, as you know, a couple times. 
and they have spent a million and a quarter so far fighting me. And uh, we haven't spent anywhere near that much because we're much better at managing our attorneys than perhaps the city is. But uh, no, it's, it's, been, it's been a sacrifice. But you know, growing up, I learned that you, you got to stand up to a bully. You can't let somebody bully you. So as long as, you know, it, which is a, it's just kind of a shame uh, that it's gone down this road. I mean, I, I really want to have a cooperative relationship with the city. And, um, you know, I let them know in advance when I see a problem. And, you know, if I have to, I, I, I'll, I'll seek legal redress. But when I, what, the city's approach is never to do that with me. They just simply file a lawsuit against me. They don't say, hey, Aaron, if you do it this way, we'll be pretty happy about it. Uh, so we've had, a, unfortunately, a very adversarial relationship. But we're still committed to helping out the residents of the city. And, um, yeah, it's been a... It's been a financial sacrifice for us. We're not rich. My wife and I, we drive old cars. We you know, rent a house in the East Village, which is you know, not a high-end neighborhood. It's a nice neighborhood, but we're not wealthy people. And yeah, sometimes we say, gosh, do we really have to do this? 15 seconds. And then, and then we look at each other and we say, yeah, of course we had to. We had to do this. We are that committed to our city. So I kind of wanted to circle back on measure N. There was a few questions that were brought in the chat. So going back to measure N, if the metrics are not met and funding is removed, how will that fix the streets? How will that fix the streets? Well, you gotta ask yourself the question, why aren't the streets being fixed in the first place? I keep having to hammer this. There are lots of cities that don't have a measure O and they maintain their streets. This is really a management problem. You know, the city manager says this is a full service city. But you know what? No, we're no service city. We try to do everything in house so we don't get anything done. We overspend not getting anything done. We need to be, we need to re engineer the way we get things done at City Hall so that we can actually provide the services that other cities do. Other cities provide these services without taxing us. 3%. We shouldn't have to pay extra where other cities are able to do it with less than what we even do. What we even, what even, what we even do with. They we're talking about basic services. You need to focus on the basics. You need to focus on roads. You need to focus on infrastructure. You need to focus on providing public safety in an efficient, economical way. But if you go and Overpromise to your city employees and spend like wild, we're never going to be able to afford to do these things. We can't be the worst city in the state where we need 3% to bail us out. It's just not excusable. We need to do better. Can I hey, uh, jump am in? Am I here? the only person here that's going to answer questions directly? Thank you. What, what? I, can I jump in here? Um, there is a follow-up also from the Measure N uh, presentation, and um, it was touched on lightly about public safety. So it's a two-part question. One is it was suggested, and it was called the elephant in the room, that public safety, meaning Oxnard Police Department and Oxnard Fire Department, are um, taking their uh, a large share of our general fund. Portions of that are also funded by Measure O. First question is, is the suggestion, Mr. Starr, that we take away from Oxnard Fire and Oxnard Police Department to better fund our roads and landscaping? Is that the suggestion? What I'm saying is that other cities are able to provide public safety for less money. So the question is, why? Why is their management better? Is, is, that, is that your suggestion that it take from Oxnard Fire and Oxnard Police to fund those things I just mentioned, roads and landscaping and the other things that are cut by the general services. So let me tell you a story about- Is, is that, uh, no, is that, is let, that your let, suggestion we take from Oxnard Fire and Oxnard Police to let me give you, roads? Let me, and, let, me, let, me, let me give you an example of good management. It's a, it's a yes or no question, sir. I'm, I'm gonna give you my answer. <laughs> my, an, no, I'm gonna give you my answer. So, so there was a, there was a mayor in Cala Mesa. There was a mayor in Cala Mesa who was paying huge amounts of money for 
his fire service from he was using Cal Fire. And he figured out a way to bring that in-house. In that case, it made sense. And they were able to actually spend less money on fire protection and get an extra fire engine in the process. Money doesn't translate into output. Money is an input and you can waste money. So it spend, sounds like the fire department money, and the police spend department money, on the table. That's what it Gabe, sounds like. Gabe, Gabe, nope. let me I'm ask just clarifying, sir. No, you're not. You're, you're getting into a debate. This is an informational, this is supposed to be informational. You're this asking is important questions. information. Please, please answer. Go ahead. So why don't you repeat your question? Well, I'd like to rather move on to my second part of the question. I had asked about if um, you wanted, if the suggestion was to take from Oxnard Fire and Oxnard PD, because as it relates to Measure N, if we dedicate all of Measure O money to roads and alleys, if we dedicate all of that, there are two fire stations in South Oxnard that are heavily dependent on Measure O. Will we now divert that funding away from those two South Oxnard fire departments or fire stations so we can fund roads? So Measure O is a general tax. It is no different than any other tax. It's going into one big giant pool. And the big question is, how do we provide services with the money we have? That's the really the underlying question. How do we affordably provide the services that we need with the money we have? Other cities do a good job of that. Our city does not do a good job of that. Is that not an argument in favor of Measure E or some other tax? No. It's I'll answer there. that question. If he's not going to answer directly, I'll answer it. He doesn't give a damn. He just doesn't care about that. So Let's I'll go ahead. Call it what it is. Okay, we'll go ahead and um, cut that I got right a question, there. Gabe. Oh, I got I'm a, sorry. Yeah, Gabe, can I can I ask a question? So we are at eight oh one, folks. We did promise our um, audience that we'd be at two hours. What I'm going to do though is thank um, you so much. By the way, I, yes, You're thank you. Great. I do want to thank both of our presenters, Mr. Alex Newman, City Manager. Mr. Aaron Starr, proponent and author of measures F, L, M, and N. I also want to give a huge shout out and thanks to our planning committee who helped put this together tonight. Uh, Mr. Manuel Herrera, Ms. Alejandra Valencia, Mr. Alex Ray Rivera, Ms. Yolanda Solorio, Mr. Dave Ebbett, Ms. Diana Velchi. And just so you all know, um, to not, tomorrow evening we will have at six o'clock in uh, evening, uh, community forum for our mayoral candidates, as well as our supervisor candidates. So six o'clock mayors, seven o'clock supervisor candidates. We hope that you'll tune in. If you haven't signed up yet, you can still sign up at the link that you found on the flyer, bit.ly slash oxelection20. Thank you all very much. Hope you have a really good evening. This is really great in, in information. To our two presenters, um, any unanswered questions, can we turn those over to you and you would be willing to um, have someone answer those? Thank you. And nods. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you all very much. Have a great thank evening. You everyone. See you later. Good night. Thank Good you, night. everybody. You're great. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, and thank you. Okay.